All right, uh, we have Paige Cruz um, for, for the next talk, and she's going to share how we can push your observability and not have a pain in the neck. All right, <laughs> get going. Yes. It's a big, it's a tall order for a talk, I know. So, uh, hello, welcome to this session. I'm very happy to be here at Regex. I'm Paige Cruz. I work at a little company called Chronosphere. We're built on open source observability. Um, and I've got a couple questions to get, uh, get to know each other. So one, if you recognize the first monitoring tool you used on the job up here, raise your hand. Yeah, same here. And if I missed any, talk to me after. Always want to grow the slide. Second question, do you agree that the statement changing, chasing a single pane of glass that is the one observability and monitoring tool to rule them all is a fool's errand? Um, yeah, I'm with you there. <laughs> and some people are surprised that I have that opinion considering I work at an observability vendor. And of course, I would love if Chronosphere was the only observability platform that you used. Yes, um, I am paid by them. However, <laughs> I really haven't seen one solution that can meet front end engineering needs, security, infra, back end. I've seen tools that are good in one area and kind of middling in the rest. and when we look at the industry and we do these surveys, the reality is most organizations have between three to 10 different observability tools. So you want to swap? Yeah. So what this means is what you're being marketed, one single pane of glass, what maybe some engineering leaders in your orgs think we ha should have one tool is very different from the reality where us as engineers are contending with five to 10 different observability tools that maybe have data siloed and it's this really messy thing to try and figure out what is happening with your system. And the last reason I kind of think that this is a fool's errand is that a lot of orgs really confuse buying an observability tool with setting an observability strategy. Two totally different things. Yes, your vendor can help you develop a good strategy, but it's really something that's specific to your org. So. We'll kind of rewind, how did I end up working for a vendor and telling you that you should probably get used to having multiple tools? Well, <laughs> I like to say that I was a baby developer, born in a Docker container, shipped to an EC2 instance provisioned by Terraform. I kind of grew up in this world of complexity, scale, the cloud, and in the beginning, all I knew was proprietary instrumentation. But <laughs> in the years since, I've come to a more balanced view and really embraced the power of open source because I've been on both sides of the observability vendor and client perspective many times over. I'm not kidding, we're gonna do a quick walkthrough. First, I started out as a vendor at New Relic. We obviously monitored ourselves with New Relic, and this was back when like microservices were super hot and APM like ruled the world. Then I followed a bunch of relics over to Envision, where I was an SRE in charge of mo the monitoring migration. Um, and I learned some very expensive lessons and also why to not believe one vendor's marketing hype. Um, I quickly ran back to observability um, where I went to Lightstep and really thought, tracing is gonna change the world, we're never gonna look back, who needs metrics and logs? Um, <laughs> that brought me to Weed Maps, which is a cannabis platform. And I there did a Rancher to Kubernetes migration and a CI-CD vendor migration. So I've had a lot of experience with taking all of the things that touches a company's services and infrastructure nodes from one vendor to another and how painful and expensive and long that process can be. And so today I'm back in my happy place in observability at Chronosphere and really I can't quit because I think there's just so much work to be done in this space. I just don't think that the average developer's experience with observability is seamless or easy. I think we've actually made things quite complicated for you all. And so, all of this to say, I've developed a lot of opinions based on monitoring, observability, and engineering reliability, and I hope that you can see that my perspective is not of big monitoring, but it's balanced from experience being on both sides of this relationship. So today, the big opinion is why I think single pane of glass is just a fool's errand and what we could be doing instead to increase observability and solve your immediate pain points today. So let's talk about this. My first argument, or the first argument a lot of people say is, I have too many tools. I have tool sprawl, 
I'm overwhelmed. It needs to be addressed. If only operators and developers looked at the same data in the same system, we'd probably have smoother incidents. And like in practice, everywhere I went, devs lived in fancy enterprise monitoring tools, your data dogs, your new relics, and the operators were living off of like Grafana and Prometheus and cobbled together like community dashboards. And I thought, this is my problem to solve. I need to bring the people together. One platform is the way. But once I started talking to my operator friends, I realized that the Prometheus world and the enterprise world were like two totally different UX philosophies. It's like Mac versus Windows. It's not as easy to just pick up everything you know from one ecosystem and bring it into another. And these are tools we depend on to make sure our applications are healthy and alive. So you really want to make sure your developers and operators are comfortable and confident with the tools that they've got. And as much as I tried to bring my ops friends into the fancy enterprise monitoring space, um, it was never going to happen considering how much of a market share Prometheus metrics have, especially in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So what about tool sprawl? Well, I had to change my philosophy on this after reading Catchpoint's 2023 state of SRE report, where the majority, 59.1% of respondents, said that tool sprawl was actually a minor or non-existent problem for their org. And the way that Catchpoint kind of backed up this data is to say it's not just about how many tools you have, but it's are those tools providing value? And if each of your tools is providing value, then it's not really a big problem if you have two or three. I mean, I think when I talk to orgs that have 10, I'm like, I don't know about that. Um, but you really have to look inside your org with your people. Is everybody getting value from all of our tools? And I'm totally not against consolidation. Again, like, would be great for me in my wallet if everybody went out and got Chronosphere. But after becoming a power user in three different observability tools, I'm really tired of learning new query languages, navigating against like totally different UX patterns, um, trying to bridge what I know conceptually to be true about monitoring concepts versus what, how it's been implemented in other systems. And I really had to realize that even though at every company I've been like the monitoring person, uh, I don't always have insight into how many tools we have. And so when I was interviewing for one vendor, they said, oh, how's your company liking our platform? Uh, how, how are you guys doing with tracing? And I said, what? <laughs> I did not know we paid you guys. I did not even know teams were tracing. This is wild. So while consolidation is nice, um, it is really difficult, even for organizations that care, to have a handle on everything that's going on. And so what I took away from the Catchpoint survey, reflecting on my experiences with the sprawl at different companies, is that monitoring tool consolidation may not actually be a problem you need to solve. And it could be OK for dev and ops to live in different observability tools, provided each brings value. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can live in a multi-tool system later. My second big lesson was to really embrace open source observability. Um, the times have totally changed. Um, when I was starting my career, all you had was, for the most part, you had a lot of proprietary vendors dominating the system. What this meant is you as an org would get trapped into one ecosystem. And even if you wanted to move, even if you had made the case and you were totally sold on consolidating, the path to migration was very painful. You're, I have had to write. <laughs> So many different tools to translate one dashboard into another. This is not career building work. This is not exciting. This is not what gets me up in the morning. Um, and so with the rise of open telemetry and really getting cloud vendors, observability vendors, and the community together at the same table, we are getting closer to a world where you can instrument once and observe anywhere. That, I think, is very powerful for us as engineers um, to have that independence and ownership of our data. And this is kind of where there's a little bit of a irony moment because part of the beauty of open telemetry is this component called the collector. The collector serves as a proxy where you can not only process but filter but drop all different types of signals. And you might say, well, Paige, that is a single pane of glass right there. You are promoting this idea that we should have one proxy that can see everything. And yes, you're totally right. However, if the best 
UI or UX or features for front end live in one vendor versus what your infra folks need in another vendor. You can still have one view into all the volume of telemetry, who's using what, um, and still send it to multiple tools. So I think it's not quite ironic. Um, I think there's a way to make it work. If we rewind a few years, in the days of walled garden proprietary instrumentation, honestly, I, I really hated being known for monitoring migrations because they're my least favorite project and they've gotten better. But like it used to be even setting up bake-offs between vendors was like a two-month project to decide what team was going to pilot it. How am I going to re-instrument and bring in the new libraries? What component, of, like a collector, do I have to stand up? And then that's just like the technical side, let alone getting estimates for how much is this going to cost? How can I estimate what my annual bill will be? All of these things took me away from what I wanted to do, which was teach engineers how to use the system better or how to find insights or how to really explore the data that we had available. So times have changed. Like I said, the open telemetry collector, this comes from the Otel doc site. Um, lots of beautiful open source libraries for instrumentation. Of course, um, lots of integrations with the big cloud players and Kubernetes. Um, and this collector is just a proxy. It's not locking you in. It also doesn't just speak Otel. It speaks Prometheus metrics. It speaks Elastic Common Schema for logs. It really is not trying to lock you in. It's just trying to give you control over your data. Um, and then, yeah, you can send it to vendors. You can self-host. That's a whole different discussion. Um, and it's not just like my word you have to take. Um, there are talks from both Adobe and Pluto TV talking about how implementing the collector and switching, routing all their telemetry through that have empowered them to make better choices for tool selection, as well as just get a handle on, like, what teams are contributing the most to an observability bill. And so, like, walled gardens, kind of beautiful when you're in them, um, but over time they can really trap you um, if you're not careful about where you draw the abstraction between what you as a company build internally and what you kind of give to the vendor or an ecosystem. And the other win that we don't really talk about on the vendor side is around enablement and the community around open source because five years ago there would have been here's how you do tracing in Datadog, here's how you do tracing in New Relic, here's how you do tracing in AppD and they would all be specific to that vendor where today I have friends that are DevRels at all the observability companies and every piece of tutorial and content we write benefits you because it is not tied to our specific product, it is how to trace with Otel how to send metrics with Otel, how to drop logs from staging in Otel. And that benefits you because that's not work that you have to then do to give to your um, end user developers. So big, big win for open source and community. I really never want to see like X vendor engineer again, sort of like if you've seen Salesforce engineer pop up on like job descriptions, I started to see observability vendor um, must know how to use X. And I'm like, that is so not <laughs> where we need to be going. We need to get back to concepts, what's important for your business to observe and adapting the open source to fit your needs. Yes, this is how happy we are using open source. And basically um, the irony of, of like, centralizing your telemetry pipeline and owning that. The other plus is going back to sort of like FinOps and looking at who's causing the most volume, therefore cost of data, becomes really important. And having that in one place means you're not looking at three different vendor bills, trying to understand how they're charging for SKUs. Did this line of this metric that I added, did it cause a $10,000 spike, a $5,000 spike? Um, it's really nice to, to, to have one place to look at all of that. And originally, I gave a version of this talk at Monitorama, um, but I still think it's true if you're coming to KubeCon and Rejects that really um, no one thinks about monitoring as much as us or ab about observability. We've got a real big inside baseball program problem where we use these really scary academic terms like telemetry, cardinality, um, Observability even, I mean, the amount of times that I've had to come up with metaphors to explain observability is wild. And so 
when people talk about we have to have one tool, tool consolidation, I think what is the opportunity cost for your org? What else could you be doing with what is still, it's not a perfect seamless process. You're not flipping a switch and going from one vendor to another. There's still work and investment. So what else could your company be doing with that time? Um, even for me, who loves observability and thinks like that is where I carved out a lot of my engineering time, I had a pretty rude awakening leaving New Relic. Um, I had fully drunk the Kool-Aid. I was like, monitoring is like so important. Everybody knows how important it is. All these companies have very good incident response processes and they care about the on-call experience and like this is gonna be great. And then I joined my first, second, third company after that and I realized monitoring, observability, and on-call are like a small portion of even an SRE's time um, and especially for an application de developer. There is everything being shifted left and, left and pushed on to them and observability is just one responsibility on their plate. And nothing could have really prepared me for like the thing I thought was the super important thing that everybody understood the value of investing in being treated as this annoying chore um, or like a total afterthought. And so like I said, your team, your org, and your company can only do so many things at once. Investing in switching tooling just to switch or to chase a single pane of glass is just not necessarily at the top of everybody's list. I think if you look at not, if you're not getting value from tools, totally cut those. Um, but it's a big, you have to frame it in terms of how it's relevant for the business. And that is a part that we miss a lot um, in the observability space. Um, because also, it's really lonely if you're the one person that's like, oh my god, I love events, or oh my god, I love tracing. Um, you really have to take into account the will of the organization to change and what the overall business motivations are. And if observability is just fine and not a top line item, you either need to work to convince your leaders that it's time to switch, or you maybe just wait for another quarter or two and see how things shake out. So. How can you contend with living in a multi-tool world if you're accepting that reality? Um, the thing I tell everybody is to link your telemetry both within a single observability tool and a cross tools. Um, it doesn't mean that your data needs to be siloed. Um, today, there are lots of ways that you can bridge your logs to your events, to your traces, to your metrics, and all of the ways in between. Um, because really, We'll talk about the point of observability, but like to click from, huh, I got an alert, I'm looking at a metric chart, that thing looks funky, to look at a trace that mimics that request, to then say, okay, I think it's maybe a part of this service, how do I go to the logs? One link, I kind of don't care how many tools that I had to go through, what I care is how quickly I could go from my thought of, that looks weird, I need to, I need to zoom in, um, or I need to zoom out and see what looks like normal. If I can do that with one click, which you achieve by linking your telemetry, that is one way to contend with having multiple tools. Um, another thing, if you're using tracing, thanks to the W3C working group, we have the concept of baggage. Um, and this is where you propagate down your trace um, different metadata that's important. So things that are only accessible further up um, in the call chain, like product IDs, origin IPs, account IDs, um, all of that sort of stuff. If your organization really relies on dashboards and charts, which many of us do, basically everybody today lets you add a widget with text where you can yourself link, here's the log query for this service, or here's how you get to the traces, or here's the logs live in this other tool, here's a link, so you don't even have to think about that in the moment. Um, the next level is to templatize those links and pass them out so people aren't handwriting them because there's so many problems with giving people an open text box and expecting uh, the same results. So those are two ways. If you wanna link your logs and your traces, add your trace ID and your span IDs to your logs so that you can go from logs to a trace. Um, yeah, so link, please, please, please link your data. If you do nothing else, make it easy to go from one type of telemetry to another, no matter how many tools you have. Um, because most of us become power users in one ecosystem, and I personally have fought with Kibana query language too many times to count, and I would have really loved if someone just gave me a link. <laughs> um, so 
what is the goal at the end of the day? Like, what is observability trying to do for you? Um, why does it not matter necessarily how many tools you have? What is the outcome? Well, if we imagine that our services are cars and we're stuck in a traffic jam, like from a services perspective, most of the time we're gonna look at some metrics. We're like, okay, we're stuck, can't really see too much else. Um, we know something's wrong, we're waiting, um, we're idling. We zoom out a little bit, maybe we're looking at events or traces in aggregate, and we're like, okay, I see where, <laughs> don't see why, don't see what, but I see where something's going wrong. What you naturally wanna do is zoom in. This is when you dial in to look at specific log lines or a trace waterfall view um, or events in a given timeline. So the power of observability is this being able to zoom in and out to look at things, to ask questions, and to immediately be able to get um, answers about what you're asking. And it really doesn't matter how many tools you have to do that if they're providing value along the way. So living in a multi-tool world, I think just even figure out if tool sprawl is even the right problem to solve in your org, it likely is we need to set an observability strategy independent of what vendors and ecosystem we choose. You should embrace open source instrumentation because it gives you the power and control over where your data goes and how much of it you've got. Check out the open telemetry collector um, for how to uh, route all that telemetry, link your telemetry across tools. <clears throat> and the one I didn't get to talk about was Part of an observability strategy is consistent metadata, metadata tags and labels across your telemetry. So even if I'm in a different system, I know I can type env, not environment, because that's the kind of stuff that drives me bonkers. <laughs> um, and it's that cognitive load that adds up over time. So we are going to turn to questions. But if you've got time at KubeCon, you can see me talking about these other things. And you can find me on the web at PagerDuty with an I, just like the company. Any questions? Yeah, th thanks for the talk. Um, you put some emphasis on uh, open telemetry and the OSS and the open telemetry collector. And actually, for years, uh, these are still mostly alpha or experimental. You know, logs are almost not, no support <laughs> metrics either. Uh, it feels like vendors are kind of using some part of it, but not maybe contributing. I don't know what's going on. but it's still not there, and, and, and it's actually 10 times more complicated to do traces to open telemetry than it, it is to using other tools, for example. So, so what's up with that? <laughs> oh, that's the like billion dollar question. Um, the ergonomics of open telemetry, where are they at, and why are there, um, okay, so let's rewind. Um, the different signals are at different levels. L traces have been GA for a while. Metrics are either experimental, they should be on their way to GA, it's a work in progress. Logs are obviously the newest. Session and profiles, we're just talking about them at KubeCon, so I think it's just getting started. Um, what I will say is, having talked to some folks at Adobe and Pluto TV, there are large companies right now running the Otel Collector in production and contributing back upstream. So if it is not the right time today for your org, it, OTEL moves relatively fast, considering how many things we have to bring together. I would say look at it in six months, look at it in a year. I think it will become the, the standard for the industry. And if your org has a risk appetite to be an early adopter, bring them along for the ride. Um, what's the second part of the question? Why, so why is it so frustrating <laughs> to use right now? Yeah, and, and the outcome is most of the time you have to go with vendors and, and yeah. in the end, different vendors. And even if they all use the same technology, actually, but it's hidden behind the vendors' modules or collectors or shippers or what, what went on. Yeah, um, and I will say, like, my company, ha we have our own version of a collector, and there's some special sauce that we put in there. Um, I think the more folks use the Otel Collector, contribute back, over time, it will become very competitive. And what I'll say is this is our first chance at it. Like, we would have never had a conversation about Datadog and New Relic accepting the same telemetry formats six years ago. So the fact that I can even talk to you about that as an option you could pull down from GitHub today is huge. It just takes, we're replacing what took these big vendors 10, 15 years to build, and we're on like, I don't know, year four of Otel. So the future is bright, the present is Dim, but the dimmer is getting turned up. How about that? It's a good investment to make in the future because of how much collaboration and buy-in there is. 
Okay, yeah, it's not perfect by any means. Uh, hello, Paige. Um, I think I actually saw your talk at Monitorama. Um, so actually, I had sort of a question that kind of relates back to your overall thesis about the uh, single pane of glass. I think it's very on... I, I think that your finger is on the pulse with respect to that, because at that other event, we noticed a lot of sort of like copies of Cribble of all these little companies that were trying to become the next Cribble and this push for op amp compliance so that everybody can basically use a third party orchestration tool to then allow all these different vendors to basically no longer be on a single pane of glass. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on like, you know, companies that are sort of middleware sort of eating the observability tools lunches, so to speak, kind oh. of like Cribble and then all of the other little offshoots that we probably saw at Monodrama. Yeah, I think it is it is a big shift for big monitoring and big observability, but I think it's one that's a long time coming because um, no longer can you depend on, oh, it would take you six months to leave my ecosystem, so I know that I'm going to get you till, I'm going to get you to renew the contract and I'm going to keep you here. It means we as vendors have to compete on features, reliability, availability. Um, I think it's for the best, and I do think the more you push vendors to support Otel, like truly support the whole way so you can bring your own collector, um, the better. There are varying shades of support within uh, the competitors. But I think it's overall a net win for the industry. And, you know, I would like I like to have some choices. So it's not the worst thing in the world that we've got a lot of options out there for folks and the best ones will rise up. I have to think about that some more. Hi, Paige. Um, I've read a couple of incident reports of companies, including mine, that have had uh, uh, some adventures in implementing instrumentation where the process of adding the telemetry to a code base either uh, causes crashes right away or yeah. gets overwhelmed in short amounts of time by traffic or whatnot. Can you speak to like maturity of that process of how people are figuring out how to do this? Because yeah. um, uh, you know, big systems are hard to instrument. Uh, uh, big systems behave differently than you think that they actually do. Like, how are people going to cope with that complexity? Yeah, there's, um, I recently saw, I wish I could remember the name of it, a, it was a really nice browser-based tool for testing your open telemetry collector configs and it's sort of a way to validate um, the changes you're making at, at least at the central config level that they're gonna pan out. Um, I think we see this a lot. I mean, I, I had just read a story where a developer added a metric and it caused a $30,000 increase in their next month's bill, and they had no visibility into that until the bill arrived, and that's just, like terrifying, um, especially for a small org. But even for a big org, I think the mistakes that I see are people turning to auto instrumentation and being like, that's step one, auto instrument, and then we'll go in and manually add what we need. But they never take the time to say, well, what is this auto instrumentation emitting? Do I even need all of these metrics or the logs at this level or even tracing. Tracing can be expensive. There are lots of ways that you can bring that cost down. But if you can really have the conversation about what do we need to understand our systems? What are the problems that we need? Like, what are we providing? How do we know it's broken? And what signals would we look at? If you have that conversation before even diving into a vendor or a tool or an ecosystem, talking to the people at your company about that, that's your North Star as you instrument. And I think you just got to be careful. Instrumenting as you go, test locally as much as possible, but really look at the defaults that are coming out of systems and um, find a tool that helps you understand both the metadata you're adding, how much the metadata is costing you computationally and financially, as well as the actual signals themselves. Uh, but it's, it's, there's no easy answer, sorry. <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question. If not, thank you, Paige. Okay. <laughs>